What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another edition of the Victory Life Legacy Podcast. I'm your host, Dwight Vick, former all-conference lineman and captain of Virginia Tech, also owner and founder of Victory Life, along with my brother, my young G, Danny Noakes, my co-host. Uh, also, you may know him from 106.7 The Fan and also radio talk sports stuff in Richmond, as well as Virginia Tech pregame radio show back in the day with Kyle Bailey. We're back for episode 17. Today, we got two uh, legends jumping on with us to give us some help to break down UVA spring game and spring practices of Mod Hawkins, along with uh, former Virginia Tech great and safeties coach Pearson Prelo. But before they jump on, we got a few minutes before Ball Hawk jumps on. Danny, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, partner. It's good to be talking with you. Glad we, we've got some spring practice to break down. It's a fun time of year. Great time to look forward to whatnot. Well, Final Four action coming up this weekend. Not bad, right? Can't complain. Yeah, yeah. Final Four. You got um, Carolina and Duke. Never before had that matchup. And then we also have Villanova and Kansas. Actually, it's a big time with all the upsets and all the shakeups with the uh, Kentucky's losing and the Tennessee's losing and the other blue bloods, Michigan State, uh, you have a really a blue blood all final four. Um, still a bit of a surprise. I did not see Carolina getting there. And that really, to be honest, at one time, I didn't know if Duke was going to get there. Villanova, quietly every year, Jay Wright has those guys in the mix. And they're right there again. They won two national championships, I believe, in the last six years. And, you know, they are an official blue blood. I mean, they're tucked away up in Philly. And they play great basketball. They run that four guard offense. They're fun to watch against Kansas, which quietly had a quiet one seed run. They're the only one seed left. And, you know, it seems like every year Kansas runs through the Big 12 and they get in a chance to, to make a run to the championship. And then they get in a tournament and you never know what Bill Self, but you know one thing that Kansas is going to be one of the premier teams in college basketball. Yeah, they, they definitely are. And I, I'm definitely still in a basketball mood. I got my new ACC champs <laughs> t-shirt on to, to rep our Hokies, you know, had to, had yes, to cop some of the merch. It's all about winning championships, right? Yeah, yes, man. Sir. It's, yes, sir. it's a blue blood final four, but I'm not mad at it. You know, when we were watching the end of these elite eight games last weekend, I kind of liked the idea that we were going to see Duke, UNC, Villanova, Kansas. I think those are very clearly the teams, the four teams that are playing the best basketball right now. And yes. A ton of credit, I think, just because we watch a lot of Duke in North Carolina to both of those programs, specifically Duke, though, who obviously played in the ACC championship, losing to Virginia Tech. And they really flipped a switch, it seems like, when the tournament came around because they're playing as well as anybody right now. I would not want to line up against Duke and the talent on that roster, but they're playing with sort of heavy hearts because Coach K ain't coming back next year. Yeah, no, and I think that they now figured it out on how to manage – those expectations with Coach K not coming back. Before, I felt like um, an ACC championship game against Tech, even though Tech earned that win, and even against that last home game against Carolina, they mm -hmm. looked like they were pressing. They looked tight. They looked stressed. Well, now the tournament is a new season, and they kind of figured it out. You know, um, A.J. Griffin is a great shooter for them. 6'6 six, six wing, can attack the basket. Mark Williams, great post player, great rim protector. He's a Virginia guy. Uh, from the 757 from my neck of the woods down in Norfolk. He's figured things out. He came on strong last season. Bancaro, 6'10", 260. Um, and, and when he plays like it, he no one can guard him. No one. No one can guard him in college basketball. But the key to that team is Jeremy Roach. Very similar to love with Carolina, except for Jeremy Roach doesn't have to do the scoring love does. Jeremy Roach is hitting the clutch baskets, penetrating, dishing at the right time and picking his spots. And to me, Coach K will get the credit because of the adjustments, the zones, the press. But Jeremy Roach is the reason. Another Virginia guy, Paul the Six, like yes, Trevor Hill, is the reason they're in this Final Four and have a chance to win the national championship. Paul the Sixth, man. I almost went to school there. I was very close to going to school there. Hey, okay. Anybody that – Anybody that knows me growing up knows that I went to St. Timothy's, which is a Catholic school, kindergarten through ninth grade, eighth grade. Actually, they have preschool now, whole preschool. So a lot of my classmates went to Paul the Sixth. Most of them went there, and I just decided not to. But how about, like you mentioned, there's a couple of guys from Paul the Sixth. You got a guy from DeMatha. I mean, the WCAC has always been one of, if not the yes. best high school basketball conferences in the country. I but... I'm hoping the fact that 
Virginia Tech staff now consists of a Demat the legend and Mike Jones that maybe they can start to bring some of that talent back down to Blacksburg. Not that they've ever been getting that sort of talent down to Blacksburg. Although Hadim C went to Oak Hill. So that's kind of the same, <laughs> not, not the same geographic area, but sort of the same tier of high school basketball programs, if you will. No question, man. And, you know, Damatha and uh, with the, they mentioned the recruiting staff, what, what Mike Young has on the staff, you'll see a lot of recruits coming there from the DMV. As a matter of fact, Jay Wright on a, a podcast or an interview I heard him on, he talked glowingly. They asked him about how do you get so much talent? He said the DMV. In Northern Virginia, for those, that's the DMV, Northern Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. I'm a 757 guy. They're not talking about Ty Ward and Richmond. They're talking about Northern Virginia, D.C., and Maryland. And, you know, obviously, um, it's just one of those things, man, where people up here just value basketball. Football's big, but not like basketball. There are tons of hoopers up here. I mean, I coach AAU. I see it all the time. You see it in high school sports. Uh, that's why when my son's team made the all metro team, I'm not all metro, the rankings, they were in the top 10, top 12. You talk about ACC basketball, you look at the lineage of that conference, many of them come from the, the DMV. Yeah. And I have to admit, there's a documentary out there somewhere that I was, I believe, was directed, produced by Kevin Durant, uh, a product of not the WCAC, but a DMV high school basketball program. I think it's called something in the water. The water and it's about, yeah. yeah, it's about all those, it's about all those guys. There's been a ton of NBA talent that's come out of that area. I need to watch that. I don't know why I I'm dragging it. my feet on that. Yeah. It's a few years old. I watched it too. And um, we actually got upset because something in the water is a tie water thing. Um, oh, because, because we say we've always said it, nothing against KD. And yeah. Those guys from PG County, but a tie water guy, that is something we've been saying for decades, especially with the emergence of, you know, Lawrence Taylor, Michael Vick, Tyrod Taylor, Plessica Allen Burner, Iverson. Allen Iverson. I mean, mm -hmm. we've been saying that for years, but it's all good, man. You know, people from D.C. and Maryland sometimes lump Virginia together. And when I moved right. there to Northern Virginia in 2000, it was like, oh, so um, where are you living now? At the time, I was living in Fairfax. And they were like, oh, is that near Richmond? I'm like, no, man. What? Um, <laughs> yeah, because some people, <laughs> man, you got to understand some, man. Some people are in D.C., or PG County never really leave yeah. that area. They yeah. only know they know they know Virginia and they know we they respect us now, but they they consider, you know, like going to the bridge of Terabithia. They think <laughs> they're going, you know, and, and it's so close. It's just one of those things where um, you know, Virginia is is not that far. I mean, people I commute to, you know, Virginia from Maryland to DC. So it's wild, man. It is yeah. wild, man. <laughs> Well, Fairfax yeah. isn't that far from D.C. That's why I thought it was funny. You know, I being from Chantilly, Chantilly is just a, a town over from Fairfax. I mean, there's a lot of overlap there. That's funny, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. But um, before Hawk jumps on, man, um, I'm going down to the spring game and I'm looking forward to actually I was just texting as uh, uh, big Derek Smith was hitting me up. You know, for those that nice. remember, Derek Smith played left tackle for uh Washington football team for a few years also played beside me at Virginia Tech um great player uh he was just making sure I was going to be in Blacksburg so I will be in the Berg that weekend um a lot of people are coming back I think that spring game easily will have 55 60,000 people there man and uh we're going to talk a little bit about that when Pearson jumps on you and I have a special relationship with Pearson as yeah. both of us used to do you did the pregame show with him and yeah. I jumped on and then, of course, I played with Pearson mm -hmm. and um, I talked to him. So it'll be good to pick his brain. A lot going on in Blacksburg with position changes, new energy, new faces, some old faces. So it's going to be a lot of fun. But um, we're waiting on Hawk to jump on here. About Ahmad Hawk is to talk about UVA. Just for those listening and watching, we do have other programs and teams up here. Danny and I are uh, Hokies through and through. But... <laughs> Ahmad is somebody I've grown up with, and mm -hmm. he is a media personality and mogul. There's a lot of stuff for the ACC and UVA. So we're going to pick his brain just to hear what our rivals are doing in Charlottesville. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm Go really ahead. excited to talk to Ahmad because I, I've never had the chance to talk to him before. I've listened to a lot of his content. I know you guys played against one another. And, you know, with Pearson, my fondest memories are of the spring game broadcast that we all used to do together. So this is a really fun time of year. Welcome, Ahmad. Welcome, man. Yes. 
Welcome to the show, Amon Hawkins. Okay, we were just giving him a glowing introduction for those <laughs> that don't know, um, and uh, many of them do know. Amon Hawkins is my young brother. Um, I support everything he does. He's got, he does about, if you think I'm busy, he's involved in 20 different things every day. He does a morning blog podcast before work, one in the afternoon, Twitter spaces, helps with um, the walk uh, with the, the UVA feature coaches and players, does radio, television, also, for the Hokie fans that are supporting us, he is the one that broke us heart, broke our hearts. My senior day, 1998, the catch. Um, <laughs> last time UVA beat us in Blacksburg. But we got a mod on here, man, to talk about UVA, the coaching changes, and also spring practices and touch on recruiting. Hawk, how you doing, man? Doing well. How you gentlemen doing tonight? Oh, yeah, we're doing good, man. It's, it's good to have you on, too. Uh, you know, because we get to talk about sports. You know, you and I have been talking the last three days about the Oscars yeah. and Will Smith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Aren't just we all comedian. tired of that? I'm just a comedian, man. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Danny, this is your first time talking to Hawk, man. He has an alter ego called Petty Hawk. And this won't be the last time Ahmad will be on this. He'll be on this, this show again once the season starts. And he'll jump back on when you and I do the Vic 757 show with Mike. So, You'll get familiar with Petty Hawk. Maybe not in the in, in that manner we do on the other platforms, but Petty <laughs> yeah, Hawk yeah. Is- he yeah, he tamed on when when, he, when I'm a guest, Petty Hawk is very respectful and tame. So Vic sees another side of him that everybody loves, but sometimes is is not always conducive and, and healthy. So I, yeah. I pick and choose when I bring him out. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's jump into it, Hawk, man. I know you're a busy man, and we appreciate you jumping on. We wanted no to have you on, man, because Danny and I, we cover tech sports. We also cover pro sports. We also talk, you know, life issues. But we definitely stick to sports, even professional Washington football team, whatever's going on, free agency. We wanted to chop it up with you because your program, UVA, like ours, went through a coaching change. Um, yeah. Ours was wanted. <laughs> we were wanting to change. <laughs> Yours was a bit of a surprise. But – um. You know, I, I was a respectful, I was respectful and 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 I like Bronco and I know mm-hmm. you did too. And um, it was a yeah. surprise, but it is a business and he did what was best for him and his family. Now you have a new guy in Coach Elliott, man. So just talk about the coaching changes and what's been going on since he hit the ground running in Charlottesville. Yeah, it's a great question. So Bronco Mendenhall did, ex- did an exceptional job uh, coming in, changing the culture, uh, getting us back getting us back to our winning ways, returning to bowl games or being eligible uh, to attend bowls, um, keeping uh, academics as the number one priority and developing young men. So we appreciate what his staff came in and did because it was a, a different dynamic for them. You know, BYU is a bubble. You you understand the type of young man that you're trying to recruit and um get to come transit to your school versus when you come to UVA and the ACC school, the world is open to you. It's a world is an oyster now. And they had to learn the ropes. They had to come back to our hometown area, the 757, the 804, all the Virginia schools. They had to build those relationships because it was dry there. And um, he did a phenomenal job Um, with the departure of Bryce Perkins and then with COVID, it was some rough years, uh, 500 football team. This year we had a, explosive offense and defense took some lumps and you, and you guys know when you're a head coach, you have a, a specialty, right? Like either you're an offensive head coach or a defensive head coach because you were either offensive coordinator or a defensive coordinator, you know? So he's a defensive guy. So when the backbone isn't strong, a lot of people start to question your philosophy and what you're doing and the development of your players. And um, I guess with the NIL and the transfer portal with COVID, it's a lot of things that played a role in Bronco just wanting to step down. And then the coaching search took place. Um, a lot of reports saying the great Anthony Poindex was going to be the head coach. So a lot of guys like myself we, um, got excited. And um, you had a lot of reports saying the job was his. And lo and behold, it was a special coach named Tony Elliott that was being interviewed as well. Coming from Clemson, having a great story. We kind of overlap my last year here. He was a walk on at Clemson, but I don't think he played that game from the times I've talked to him. He said, I didn't play that game. So, uh, but he, you know, he took the job very impressed with this, you know, conference when he first took the head coach's job alums. We tried to show support because it looked, the optics were bad. 
you know, I'll be the first to say the options were bad because we were so excited about Anthony Poindex. And I had a Twitter space, and I want to say like 500 people jumped in there. And I let people voice, you know, their excitement, displeasure, anything they want as far as like Coach Poindexter, Dexter, when he was in the running for the head coaching job. So a lot of people um, got things mixed and screwed and interpreted that we didn't want Coach Elliott. And I always say folks hear what they want and they interpret things the way they want to. It's my job to make sure my stance is always the same. That was my brother. I was excited for my brother, but that wasn't taken away for our excitement of Tony Elliott and what he brought to the table. So um, he's hired a great staff. The players are excited to have him here. Um, they started spring ball. This is the second week now. Um, so I get the intensive practices next week. They got some scrimmages as well. Great coaching staff, man. And I'm excited to see what he's going to do with the program. Yeah. What well, you know, what's interesting too, Ahmad, I, I always liked Bronco. I, I had the chance to interview him actually a couple of times at the ACC kickoff, and he was always super down to earth. I am on the record saying that he's a much more likable guy than Justin Fuente was. <laughs> much more. <laughs> much more. Especially when it came to to the media stuff and whatnot. So I remember I remember seeing that news too and being shocked. And uh, you know, when it came down to it. There was a big emphasis with Bronco Mendenhall, and I assume it's going to continue with this new coaching staff too, on yeah. the state of Virginia yep. and, you know, just being in the Hokies fan space and seeing what they're saying on Twitter and whatnot. There was always a lot of bashing of UVA constantly having beating Virginia Tech on their mind, but it's yeah. very understandable because for both of these programs, I think the most important step forward that they could take to get back to where they were when they were at the peak of their power mm -hmm. is to regain traction in the state of Virginia, whether that's via recruiting, the relationships, like you said, Ahmad, or, yep. you know, just beating your rival every single time. And, and from a Virginia Tech standpoint, you know, they're normally beating UVA, but now they've got losses to Liberty and Old Dominion on their resume in the last couple of years, the, the, both of which were under Justin Fuente. So I imagine for Tony Elliott and UVA, they're going to continue to emphasize needing to get back to, on track here in the state of Virginia. Yeah, absolutely, because it, it demonstrated uh, in 2018, um, as great as we played all season, as great as Bryce Perkins was his first year as a starter, we lost to Virginia Tech. And sometimes, you know, I always look at the wire where Marlo, he said, you know, went to security guard with the blow pop and was like, you want it one way. It ain't going to be one way. And a lot of times fans want it one way. And they scream out, you know, we got to be Tech. We got to be Tech. And Bronco makes, he listens. And he makes a mantra, be tech. He starts a clock because that's what the, all the fans talked about. And it was like, he listened to y'all. He's showing you it's important. Every break, be tech. But now it's like, oh, you guys are only focused on tech. It's like, wait, wait a minute. He's just doing what y'all wanted him to do. Like that's why I'm I'm somebody with be consistent, you know. And I'm 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 my petty hawk alter ego is like, if you being a hypocrite, I'm gonna call you out. Like. Is, is damn if you damn if you don't. So with Tony Elliott, it's one of the things where he got to meet with Bronco. He understands how smart and bright Bronco was. Bronco was um, impressed with Tony as well. And the one thing that I love about Tony when we talk candidly, he was like, well, Hawk, I'm not trying to make this Clemson at Virginia. I want what you guys had. What did, what's the difference? Like, what was it like when you played here? All right, Wally Rayner. What was it like when you played here? Mm. Aaron Brooks, what was it like when you played here? Mm. Chris Slay, that's on staff, what was it like when you played here? I want that. Marcus Hagens, what was it like? Curtis, uh, uh, Clint Center, what was it like? So he's trying to get a better feel for what the alums miss. What's the allure of Virginia? Because he wants it to be organic. He just want to grasp that straws. And that's what they felt like Bronco did, just grasp that, oh, you said B Tech? Boom, that's making a mantra. But he really meant it. The players really meant it. The players understood the rivalry before then. They didn't know. Like when we went to Tech the first time, when we used like 12 quarterbacks and got oh, a yeah. hit up, oh, yeah, you know, they that. learned the hard way. It's like the mama said, don't touch the stove, it's hot. And then you touch <laughs> it, you like hot. They realized this rivalry is real. When, uh, what's the former fullback when we was down there in 2018 that was like, this is hard. And Rogers. Sam Rogers. They got to see firsthand. Yeah. I always okay. tell folks, as bad as you want to talk trash about tech, that atmosphere is second to none, bro. Me as a competitor, I want to go to tech and beat them there because 
that atmosphere is like fulfilling to me as a competitor. Like Vic, no, I, I, I get on Twitter. I give Virginia Tech their props. Um, I have fun with the back and forth banter and my fan base was like, yo, how are you being like cordial with them? I was like, bro, like I know I could cut my switch off. My switch is dangerous. So I have to cut it off. But um, to go back to Tony Elliott, man, he really wants to understand the legacy of Virginia football. He wants to implement that legacy. And um, Carla Williams and the administrative staff and the donors are doing an excellent job of raising the money to help help us break ground uh, for our new facilities and things of that nature. But also know that the product on the field has to be has to be up to par as well. No doubt, Hawk, man. And you're right, man. And you mentioned some some great names. I, I met Symptom up here with my guy, Kenan Carter, before he went to coach the women, Mary Kenan Carter, the former UVA, great defensive tackle. And me and him are uh, close friends. We're like brothers, man. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's all love away from the game, but, but the rivalry is real. And you and I were fortunate enough to play during the golden era. And when I say golden yep. era, Virginia Tech and UVA were both not just two of the best programs in the state. That was a given, but they were two of the best programs in the country uh, yep. during our time. And it was great. It was very similar to a high school rivalry with Hampton and Bethel or mm -hmm. West Westfield and Centerville or Deep Creek and, and, and Western Branch. It was it was huge. And it yep. was sold out. And it was all these guys from Virginia, D.C. and Maryland. Um, you know, in my humble opinion, it's not just about winning the state. It's about the culture. And I think, you know, I don't know what Brent Pryor, as far as the results are going to be for Virginia Tech, but I feel like similar to Tony Elliott, he wants it to be the way it's supposed to be. Uh, mm -hmm. You have your hand on the Virginia Tech, not just, excuse me, the UVA football program, but UVA sports, basketball. Yeah. When you look at um, the team you have, I know it's tough because you haven't been in practices, but you guys return a very, very good quarterback at Brendan Armstrong. Yes. I mean, he's That's tons true. of records. Play hurt. I was up mm -hmm. late watching that BYU game. I thought they were going to score 900 points, man. Yeah. <laughs> he got hurt, and he came back and played uh, a few games later, and he gave it his all entire season. He was money. Um, what are the expectations for him? And I know it's tough to – we can't really talk about the season yet because it's spring. But what yeah. do you think – what do you see for him this year? Because uh, he's going to be going through some changes with coaches and things like that. Do you see him elevating the team even more or do you feel like he's going to kind of try to figure things out at the beginning because it's a new system? What do you yeah. see for him? I, I really, uh, Vic, that's a great question. I really foresee like wholeheartedly as, as an analyst, like the fan part of me is like, oh, he's going to do even better because he got all his weapons back. He got another year. But realistically, with a new scheme, uh, with, with Kitchens as the offensive coordinator, with Tony Elliott um, did at Clemson as the offensive coordinator, um, I really see us being more balanced, not 50, 50, you know, but balanced in the sense of as coach kitchen said, and I love this quote, if we have to run the ball to beat you, we'll be willing to run the ball to beat you. Mm. If we're successful running the ball, we're going to just going, we're going to keep running the football. We know what five can do. We know in coaching eyes offense, the quarterback is 90% of it because it's a heavy workload. It really is. Mm. It really is. If you play quarterback and coaching eyes system and you are successful, you the truth. He asked his quarterbacks to do a lot. You take a beating, you have to show, display toughness, and Brennan did that. He has a plethora of receivers. I mean, Coach Marcus Hagens and the way that he developed these receivers, I'm not saying this because I love him like a brother, but he's a great teacher of football for those receivers. We have backs that are very capable that the last offensive scheme didn't display as far as consistent runners. Like Mike Hollins is a very good back, very good back. Coach 2J, he was thrown curveballs because our offensive line, all those guys transferred mm -hmm. to better themselves for, for whatever reason was. It's not a stab in the back. You're free to move about the cabin in which any way you want to. And those gentlemen took the opportunity with not knowing who their coach was going to be, they transferred. So he hit the recruiting trail when he was rehired. Coach 2J showed that, you know, he'll, he'll strap his boots up and, and go recruit and he'll develop. So the biggest question mark for us offensively would be the offensive line. What's the best way, Vic, to get an offensive lineman in the groove? Let them put pin his ears back and be that's real physical. Yes. You know, not kick slide. Kick slide, that's not to your event. But if mm -hmm. I could say downhill, put your foot in somebody, I mean, your, your face mask somebody's chest and drive, you're going to get in the groove a whole lot quicker. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just one of them things that where. I feel like schematically, it's going to help Brendan. Schematically, it's going to make him a more attractive pro prospect because 
um, catching comes from the NFL, and it's going to require Brendan to really show true leadership because the numbers were gaudy last year, but the wins didn't follow. Now they want to see, hey, can you win and push your program to the next level? And that's what he needs. And when it comes to breaking down what he can and can't do, he has weapons. And that kid can flat out let it let it fly. So um, I don't expect his numbers to be what they were last year. I welcome it. But if I have to take four or 500 yards off his total offense, but it equals three or four more wins, <laughs> I'll take it. Well, well, hold on, Danny. I know you got a good question, but I just want to say this too. In his defense, because I watch, I've been, I grew up on ACC. Even when I was in the Big East, I would watch ACC games. Mm -hmm. And I always watch UVA because that's our in state rival. Plus, growing up, you know, I was a Terry Kirby fan, Sean Moore, Herman Moore. Plus, all my guys that didn't go to tech went to UVA. So, you know what I'm saying? Marcus Higgins is my guy, Ahmad Hawkins, all those guys. But don't the tell them the time, story, though. Don't tell them the no, story. I'm not going to tell the story. We'll wait. That's, I'm, that, we'll wait for another time. But in fairness to Brendan, man, a lot of those losses weren't on him. The defense dropped the ball. That's true. I Absolutely. mean, come on, bro. Like, you know, I'm not. You know, you, we keep it real, Danny and I. I know you do too, Hawk. I mean, yeah. The defense, the defense let them down, man. So, Brendan is like Brendan Josh is, Allen and the Buffalo Bills versus KC. Fourteen seconds. Do your job. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a knock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Danny. I'm sorry. I just wanted to just defend Brennan real quick because the quarterback is a lot of blame and a lot of praise. But yep. anybody that's played, it's a collective effort. Absolutely. It's defense, special teams, coaching decisions. It's a lot. You know, yep. you, but, you mentioned coaching decisions. And if we just go back to the UVA tech game from this year, right, UVA is in a great position to go and win the game. And they call a screen to the lineman on third and long or, or fourth and long, whatever the call was. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was one of the worst play calls I've ever Absolutely. seen. And, and I don't know anybody on either the tech or UVA side that would disagree with that. Right. And, and you so, know why that call is bad not to cut you off and I'll let you keep going. Yeah. Look at our top draft draft prospect right now. And you throw into that guy. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, oh, that, great that. point. You got Jelani Woods. Jelani Woods, tight end. Yeah. But I digress. Go ahead. <laughs> no, yeah, you're right. That and that's the point. Like I was, I was, I was gonna put more praise on on Brennan Armstrong because I think you mentioned if this offensive line play gets better for UVA this year, that seems like the perfect formula to get Brennan mm -hmm. Armstrong off and running, right? I mean, the dude can do both. He's a he's a good thrower of the ball good enough I think to move them down the field relatively consistently but he's also very mobile and mm. so you get the you you you're able to run the ball early on the game and that just opens you up for more opportunities later and they've got plenty of weapons around him that's that's been the case for the last couple of years yeah well, definitely Dan, man. hold Go on ahead. I'm gonna let Hawk get I'll get excited but Danny just real <laughs> quick before Hawk addresses that UVA is in a position that tech isn't and a few other teams because Everyone wants to trash the coastal, but if you got a quarterback in college football, you got a chance. You Just keep it. that in mind. You Can know, he pick it? Yep. Yeah. College That's football was last really, year. College football is truly dictated more by the quarterback position. You know, mm -hmm. just because of schematically is a little different because you don't have the hours as you do in the NFL. In the NFL, you can scheme up ways to really take the quarterback out of the game and everything around him has to truly operate. But we know in the grand scheme of things, that position has to be the most consistent unless you have an outlier defense. But in college football, as we saw last year, it's games we shouldn't have won, but five and those receivers were so great because we were in one dimension. We would be like 85% pass and still win. Like everybody know we're going to pass every down. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, and I don't want to make it seem like I'm like kicking coach and I while they're down because he did a phenomenal job here. But some of the times, the situation of football, we will have our best playmakers not on the field because of a certain personnel groupings, depending on the play. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, consistently seeing Lavelle Davis, uh, Dontavian Wicks, and Billy Kemp on the field at all times, like all offensive schemes have, except for ours. If, if you notice, Every play you had groupings of receivers running on and off. I did. You know, and that to me, that gives the defense a break. And we we go back to what happened versus Virginia Tech. We have an opportunity. First, look, the first play call was a great play call if Brendan's ankle was healthy. That quarterback draw was there. His ankle gave out. He said it on the coaching show that following uh, Tuesday when he came, he was like, Hulk, I forgot my ankle was hurt. He said his eyes lit up when he heard the play. <laughs> but his ankle was like, mm-mm. You know, but they wished... Because you look at that 
and I don't, I might have PTSD, but if you look at that, those four plays, Dontavian Wicks isn't in the game. I didn't even know that. The Johnny Lonnie Woods is not even, we, we bring in two backs. You make it easier for the for tech and the defensive style they run. You got two backs and you planning them. I always say the best way to beat tech is for you either got to run the football or you got to spread them out. Make them backers be, you got to cover. Mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. if you think you could beat me with your island coverage, well, it's going, I'm going to make it a trap me. I'm going to speed the game up. But if you go try to put two backs in and throw the ball versus tech, you playing into their hands with that defensive scheme. Yeah. Because, brother, they coming downhill to get you. Mm-hmm. And that's what we did. We played right into what Tech does best versus spreading them out, using Jelani Woods, using Dottavian Wicks. I know Wicks drops some balls that game, but it's one of the things that sometimes you get too smart and you got to stick with your horses, you know, because because the bread, the, the thoroughbred was injured back there at five. He's not the same. So now as a coordinator, and I couldn't do his job, but it's easy for me behind the mic. That's why I love doing it. I can't get punished for saying what I say as far as, you know, the results, because I'm just giving suggestions. But my suggestion in hindsight, because I see the result was, don't throw it to this dude. It ain't no knock against Bobby. What you, like, come on. First of all, you motion away in the end zone. Yeah. A throwback not going to work versus zone. The, the DB <laughs> right there. Right. That's a man. He's sitting, waiting for it. Yeah, well, hey, soon as we motion and the corner state time, nah, that won't, that ain't working. Yeah. So kudos to the defensive back for being smart and understanding I'm gonna be a football player, not a robot. And then y'all defense ended. Y'all ended a great job too, number eleven. Like it, it, it nah. go ahead. Well, go it goes. Ahead. You know what? You know what though? It, it's it's frustrating. You know, we share those sentiments because we had the same type of season. And what's interesting is. You talk about coaching decisions, but you guys got the ball back because Brummeister was killing it. We were controlling the clock, getting it right out. Yep. And for some strange reason, our OC puts in Brumrick, who had not been in the game at all, and he fumbles the ball. Mm-hmm. And I kept saying, why did you put him? He's cold. UVA is looking like, you know what? We don't have it. Yeah. yeah. And then we were, because we, we, for some reason, we found our running game that night. And all of a sudden, yeah, yeah. Brumlick comes in, he fumbles the ball. UVA has new life, and I'm thinking you gave the wrong guy the football, and you saw Armstrong drove him down the field, and they were cooking with grease, man. Yeah, Danny, man. Were you gonna say something? Danny, were you gonna say something about that? No, I no, I I was I was just gonna wallow in in the misery that was the constant revolving door quarterback for Virginia Tech last year because hey. I thought I thought UVA had us. I, I really Bro, did. Oh, I did too, Danny. <laughs> I did too. I'm just looking like, wait a minute. They let him complete passes down the field on the post. Like, hold on, this trips. You got a tight end to the to the boundary. Like, we we got enough guys to cover and have one free. And what are we like? I was just like, man, like it was like 2018 all over again. The fumbles yeah. right there. Well, you know what? We just just we, we I know you're busy, so I want to ask you this, Hawk, before we let you go, man. When you look at, you know, um, UVA football, you know, you're going to be at spring practices. Like I said, you know, all those guys, you're, yeah. you're like me, you and I are basically the same, mm-hmm. except I'm covering tech and you're covering UVA. But when you talk about Elliot, his staff, they got a great staff, some household names um, that I've, yeah. some of them I played against, many of them I grew up watching, Chris Slade, you mm-hmm. talk about the energy around the program, but we all three of us know press conferences, tweets, all the manufactured hype and the posters, that doesn't win football games. The, the the line of scrimmage, the talent, the depth, the schemes, the decisions, you know, Saturday afternoons, Thursday night does. When you look at the Coastal Division and you break it down, you look at Carolina just lost, you know, Sam Howell to the NFL mm-hmm. draft. Pittsburgh just lost Pickett. You know, they're always a tough opponent, but they lost like a bunch of seniors. Tech is in transition. They got some players coming back. We lost some guys to graduation. Um, you know, Georgia Tech is still rebuilding. When you look at UVA, when you look at their prognosis for the season, their outlook, do you feel like if things go well early on with the schedule that you guys can make a run and win that coastal? Yeah, that's the, that's a, that's the great thing. The schedule is very favorable and the coach staff understands that as, as players, you pay attention, but as a player, you're very naive. Um, I think Miami is a team that's dangerous because that young quarterback came on strong mm-hmm. and Miami is betooling as far as like the swagger and the belief. So they're going to get the athletes. They're always going to have those underwear Olympic champions that can fly. So that's what makes them scary. You know what I'm saying? So 
Um, that's the team that I really looked at. Like Wake Forest, their quarterback came back. I know they lost their their uh, receivers, but um, Georgia Tech lost their back. I think he went to Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, but their young quarter, he's he's a he that young quarterback is for not, like after we played Georgia Tech, I said that kid gonna be special. I don't know what they're gonna bring around him, but they have a shot with him at quarterback. But as you stated with Pitt, Kenny Pickett was basically like Brendan Armstrong, but they could run the football. You know, Wake Forest and Hartman, they can run the football. Uh, North Carolina, Howell, but they could run the football. You see the trend. Point. We just didn't invest in it. Like, mm -hmm. we were capable, but we just didn't invest in it because we were successful since two, since since a nigh guy here throwing the football. And sometimes we fall, we fall back into our comfort zone and our habit of, I'm just going to toss it around. You know, it depends on your philosophy. And you, as, as much as I say Coach Knight should have ran the ball more, his numbers are phenomenal. He broke every passing record here. He's one of the top passing offenses you'll see in the country. But sometimes that could be a detriment to what our weakness was, which was our defense, because you never had the ability to slow the game down, give them a break. I feel like if in BYU, when it became that high-powered, we made that huge comeback, we couldn't slow it down. North Carolina, kudos to them. When we played them, we made that comeback. What did they do in the second half? They ran the ball. We're going to keep him off the field. That game was crazy, too. That was like another shootout. Y'all were in some shootouts, man. man I mean, you know? we had to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, and I, I'm not. Look, like you say, Vic, I talk to all those kids. And I'm very transparent with them. And I uplift them. And I give them constructive criticism. But I had to have them realize in the game of football, yes, you guys struggle on defense. But. It's a team sport. Not saying your offense have to, has to do more, but that adult has to understand how can I better help them? Hmm, let me see if I can keep them off the field a little bit longer. They got a little bit more time to adjust with those adults, and then they can pass them up to get a timely stop. I played arena football. It's all about timely stops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's all it is. It's like NBA basketball in the playoffs with the, with the sugar thug. Give me a timely stop. <laughs> Give me a timely steal, a timely charge. You know, you get that timely tech. You know, <laughs> that's the inside joke between me. And me. So they, oh, Danny knows about sugar. Oh, Danny, you know, about oh, sugar. Yeah. yeah, he knows, know, he knows yeah. about it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. We yeah. all, we all know. You know, shout out to my Draymond Greens out there, my favorite player. Yeah. That I like to be fun of, but, but I'll take him on my team any me too. day, baby. Me too, me too. a glue guy. <laughs> You yes. win championships with glue guys. Hawk, Absolutely. It's been a lot of fun, man. This has been a lot of fun, man. I appreciate you, man. Um, as always, man. I just want to tell everybody listening on SoundCloud and everybody watching this on YouTube. This guy's one of the best out there. He just doesn't cover UVA. He covers hot topics, social injustice. He had he's open to debates and insight. He's got his just tell him how they can follow you, Hawk. All the stuff you got going on, man. Just you, oh, man, you see how you see what I did there right there. So you go to myhawkers.com. Um, I have a website where I upload any and everything that I do UVA related. And also all my podcast episode, um, I uploaded there via Podbean. But you can go to anchor.fm. You can go to iTunes, Spotify, um, any podcast platform to check me out. Um, as Vic stated, um, if you don't follow me on social media, at I am Ballhawk on Instagram or Twitter, Facebook or Mile Hawkins. You any of those videos that you miss, I try to upload them as podcast episodes. And a lot of times I like to have fun with my friends, man. And and I want to just create my own lane. Um, I did the little blurb. I'm just a comedian. That's a playoff words because I felt like, like people are allowing comedians just to say what they want to say. That's what the Will and Chris Rock Will should have never hit Chris. But right. <laughs> my my new line, my new line is I'm just a comedian because apparently if you're a comedian, nothing can be held against you in a court of public <laughs> opinion. So I'm safe. So I'm um, well said, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, man, I appreciate you guys for having me on. And um, um, yeah, man, just just try strive to be the best you that you can be and um don't make excuses, can create opportunities. That's that's how that's what I, I love. love it. I love it, I love it, and I love you, man. This is guy my Ahmad Hawkins, man. Again, NBA, baseball, football, hockey, track, UVA sports, college sports, high school sports. He is the guy to follow and check on, man, and gets Please great discussion, him. great insight, passionate. And, uh, you know, be careful. Or you might catch one of his episodes when Petty Hawk pops out. Yeah, I just I just like to tell folks, man, if you see Petty Hawk out, do not hurt, hold the curse words against me. 
because I try to make sure I keep it PG, but I'm I'm 43 years old. Sometimes I have to be grown and ignorant. <laughs> and it was good to meet you too, Danny, man. Definitely good to meet you, man. Same to you, Ahmad. I, yes, I can't wait to do it again. Chop it up very soon. And we will definitely Absolutely, have him on man. again, man. We will definitely have him on again. This show and the Vic 757 show with anytime, me, Mike, and Danny, bro, you know, yes, anytime. Sir. I always make time for, for genuine folks, man. And um, I got enough time in the day to, to spread positivity. So anytime you guys need me, man, let me know. Appreciate you, Hawk, as always, yes, man. Sir. Thank you, man. Salute to you, man. Peace out, fella. I'm so good, man. Hawkins, Thank you, man. Mike. Appreciate it. All right. Amal Hawkins, former UVA great receiver, man. Thanks for him jumping on, man. Just, just a special guy, man. He played actually at Virginia. He played receiver, cornerback. Um, you know, for those from the '90s era, he played with a guy named Ronald Curry, who was a National Gatorade Player of the Year in football and basketball. And um, he, Ahmad, set all kinds of records in high school. And what's funny is we were running, we were running team, we ran the ball. But Hawk, you know, if you look at his highlights on YouTube, man, in high school, I mean, he was catching. Pass is wide open. Nobody could guard him. He also was a great track runner. He ran on a four by one team, won a state championship, and um, ran with guys like Chris Ricks and some other guys. I believe Kahafa was on that team. So uh, just just a great guy, man. Also very passionate, like you and I, Danny. So really glad he was able to jump on. We'll get him again, like I said, on some other stuff. And and I, the thing I like about him is he's like me and you. He's honest about his program. Like we love tech. We can be honest and assess whether they're good or they're bad or in between. You know, exactly. So Ahmad, Ahmad seems exact. He seems exactly like you in terms of he's like he's like UVA's Dwight, right? On Twitter, yeah. yep. you want an honest, well-informed opinion. You go to Ahmad if you're a UVA fan. You want an honest, well-informed opinion on tech. You go to Dwight, and ever That's more and more word. people, more and more people are noticing that dude, and yeah. it and it deserves the attention I'm, I'm glad that we got to talk with him though because i've been i've been waiting for that moment and i can't wait to do it again because he's an awesome yeah. guy yeah no he is man and we're getting ready to have pearson on but before pearson jumps on um you know i just i'll just say this obviously we wanted we want tech to beat them and everything they feel the same way but i i feel like and you play you play sports danny and i play sports obviously and i just feel like you know like how i'm jealous like i look at virginia tech basketball right Virginia Tech basketball had that great run a few weeks ago in the ACC tournament, and it was their night, and everybody was talking about them. They beat Clemson, which isn't a blue blood, but they're a good ACC program every year. And then they beat Notre Dame, and convincingly. They smashed UNC, and then they smashed Duke, and that's great. But then we get in the tournament, and, and you know, you have people, like you said on our last episode, episode 16, there were people picking Tech to go to the Final Four, Elite Eight. Were, and and, yeah. and then we lose to Texas. I'm not even mad about it, but I I bring that up to say I do like the fact that Alabama and Auburn, Ohio State and Michigan are relevant in football. These are the rivalries. Same thing with Duke and Carolina in basketball. You don't have to be an alumni of either one because when you're winning, you're going to get bandwagon fans because you're winning. People don't realize Virginia Tech football before this last six-year run had tons of guys that had one credit at Strayer University that was Virginia Tech fans because they were like, you know what? I grew up in New York, but I saw Tech on TV and I was a fan. You know, winning is going to bring that. But more importantly, I, 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 I don't mind if UVA gets good because if they're good and we're good, they push us both to be great. And then you have a more respectable rivalry. Some of the best memories in Virginia Tech history is, is beating them in 2007 for the Coastal, beating them in 2011 for the Coastal. That big matchup when they got us back with uh, Perkins, that quarterback, they won the Coastal. It's better. I, I don't want to see uh, Georgia Tech and Pittsburgh winning the Coastal. Nah. I mean, I don't want to see – it's not that I'm rooting for UVA to win. It's just that, to me, I'm a Virginian, and I, I, I have state pride. And in a lot of ways, I equate some of the issues with both programs is because – the the other premier programs as we mentioned have come down and taken the talent that we both neglected and thank god as he mentioned bronco was trying to grasp his straws if he had really figured it out we would really be in trouble because we're kind of still relevant in our state because uva was recruiting outside the state too right you know, going to the midwest and going to other places like that so um it's going to be an interesting season 
It will be. And, you know, I look, I, I could say this the last couple of years, right? You look up and down the roster, both Tech and UVA. It's not like Tech's got a ton more talent on their roster than UVA does, you know? So the two programs aren't really that far apart, despite the fact that Virginia Tech's won 17 out of the last 18 games that the two have played on the gridiron. But when it, when it comes down to it, you know, Tech has been to the ACC championship game once since 2011, the, the last 10 years, right? And now oh UVA, has, UVA has been once. So, I mean, what do you really have to show for it if, if you're the Hokies, right? So, you know, I know everyone's working on getting getting that back to, to, to that point in Blacksburg. And, and this guy that we're about to welcome on has been a big part of that. Both staffs, oh, yeah. too. Yes, yes. Can't wait, man, to hear from my guy. He's joining us right now via Blacksburg, Virginia, or maybe he's in Christiansburg. I don't know. I see the setup right now. Pearson Prelo, my teammate and brother. Safety's coach is on here with the Victory Life Legacy podcast with Danny Noakes. And uh, welcome, Pearson. Welcome to the show, my dude. How you doing? Can you hear us? What's going on, man? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, gotcha. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I and, I'm in, we and I'm in Radford, Virginia, by the way. Radford. Radford, okay. I knew it was one of them. That's why I named Christiansburg, Radford, Blacksburg. That's why I went through all three just to make sure. I was like, okay, one of them you're going to be in, man. <laughs> Cool, man. And I gotta rep, I gotta rep my wife's home city, baby. Gotta rep it. <laughs> yeah, man. And and congratulations to you both, man. Your beautiful family, man. Um, I was there when it all began. That's crazy, man. We get no pillow. <laughs> yeah, man. Hey, and do me a favor, man, because I'm in rap. If this thing gets choppy, I might have to go stand outside on one leg, man. You know how to <laughs> <laughs> so so hey, if I start breaking up. I, I'm gonna go to a different location. I got the. I think I got the best feed right here where I'm at. I hope, man. Yeah, and you got a good look too. Those jerseys look sweet, man. Um, awesome. So that, that's a great setup right there. I got mine and my wife framed mine, but I gotta hang mine up again. We moved four years ago, and it's still sitting there. But I said, you know what? Don't hang it up until we get back to ten wins. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, let me let me so, ask you. Let me ask you guys this. How pumped were you to see those uniforms on the team again, like, like early last year? I mean, you got to see them actually don those jerseys again that you guys wore. Man, it, 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 it took me back, man, you know, just to see those uniforms and, and, and being in Lane Stadium. You know, it was almost like a surreal moment. It took me back to like 98. And, and you know, when you hear people talk about it being, the, you know, the throwback uniform of the 99 year, but really, you know, Michael Tate, man. I mean, uh, Dwight will tell you, we broke those things out. They called him the Michael Vick uniform, but we broke those things out our senior year with the maroon helmet, with the maroon face mask, the stripes gone. That was actually our senior year when we broke those out. Thank man. you. Okay, so the story goes, Pearson Prelo, myself, we're both captains, and Ryan Smith. I don't even know why Ryan was there. <laughs> Ryan's my <laughs> guy, though. He was a senior, too, but it was just funny. We were talking about, we're playing West Virginia. We're playing West Virginia at home. Now, they ha- they got a squad. They got Sean Foreman, Amos Dareway, uh, Mark Bolger, who played the league for Steels. a long time. Yeah, Gary Steele, Thornton, who I, I had to block both him and Thornton. And West Virginia, you know, people talk about UVA, but West Virginia and Miami were probably bigger rivals. Um, yeah. And Beans, especially back then, this is before the evolution of social media and 19 different uniform combos. So we in the locker room, we like, hey, man, we got to spice it up. We need to rock that all maroon. So Pearson and I like, hey, man, let's just go up there. You know, Jamel Smith and them were supposed to come. But next thing I know, it's just me, Pilo, and Ryan Smith walking to <laughs> Beam. We walked to Beamer's office. Chrissy, the secretary that, you know, is up there. She's like, can I help you guys? We're like, yo, we need to talk to um, Coach. We got practice. This is before practice. And we walk in there, and Beam's like, what's going on? You know, and Pearson and I, we and, and – Ryan was like, hey, coach, man, you know, we talked to everybody, everybody on the team. We want to go all maroon. And Bean sit back, he says, this weekend? <laughs> and we like, yeah, man, we want to go all maroon, man. We want to go all maroon because we had never rocked it like that, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's the first year, to Pearson's point, we took the stripes off. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was, and we won. He said, I, I tell you, I tell you, you know. You got to make sure guys are dialed in. They got to be focused. I don't want no shenanigans. And, you know, I, I and we, and we won, we won. Uh, yeah. That's the game. Ike Charlton had three picks and we look sweet out there, man. 
And what what's more crazy about that, man, if you're talking to Lester Carl and the whole maroon face mask thing that year was an accident that we just went with. They had sent the helmets off to be reconditioned. You know, the stripes were still on it. We got the stripes taken off to sort of look right, but it came back with maroon face masks on them because you remember we had the big white face mask. So, yes, yes. And, you know, that whole look, man, is, it was accidental. And, and like Dwight said, man, all maroon thing, that, you know, that was a favor. <laughs> well, Pearson, man, let's, ju let's jump into it. We, I know you're busy. You got your mm -hmm. family, you know, it's night, man. I know how it is. I know the hours you're putting in, man. Um, let's just talk about, like, how's it been, man, oh. since they were, you know, we can say you good. How, how's it been um, since all the stuff, man? I know you were there with Fuente. Um, it was the, the, the situation you, you know, thought it would be as far as results on the field. But at the same time, now all of a sudden, JC is retained. You're retained. You got promoted to safeties coach. And then you got Pry, who was there when you and I were, well, at least when I was there, 95 and 96. Um, it seems like there's a new energy right now. Like, it seems like y'all have a plan. There's purpose. There's, there's a vision. And it seems like everybody's buying in. I just feel like now, I just feel like, I don't want, I'm not trying to hear and talk about the last regime, but more so like moving forward. You know, just talk about what, what the energy is right now surrounding the program and, and, and what, what the feel is from a, just a coach's perspective. Well, you know, there's definitely, it's definitely a, a buzz going around Blacksburg and a special kind of energy, man, that, uh, you know, people are excited. You know, uh, the, the, the town is excited about an opportunity to, to progress and, and, and become a better football team. You know, Coach Pry has done a, an amazing job, and I'm, and I'm fortunate to be a part of that uh, staff that he's hired. And, and it, you know, the, the players are, you know, when you've had the kind of years that we've had in the past, you know, for whatever reason, you know, we're looking to get this program. I, I, I hate saying back to where it was because we want to get it back on track to where we were going. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because because we don't want to just take it back to where it was, you know, Dwight, like me and you were playing mm -hmm. or back when Mike Vick was playing. When we were doing that, we were starting something that that went on for, de for a decade with the 10 win season and all that. We were heading towards something special. And we took a step back, man. It's, it's honest, you know. That staff, I got to be honest, I'm indebted to it because without that staff hiring me, I probably wouldn't have this opportunity that I have now. And I worked with those guys and they poured their heart and souls into that program, but it didn't work out. Like, like a lot of things happen in this world, it doesn't work out. And now that the new staff is in, there's a buzz. And, and Coach Price is doing a great job. The staff is doing a great job. The team is rallying. We have some new energy in the building and, and I'm excited. I'm excited for the opportunity that I have. I'm excited for the opportunities players have. I'm excited that this community is ready to rally. And I, I look for a big turnout uh, April 16th. Hopefully the weather holds out and, and we'll get to showcase, you know, some of that thing, some of the things that we're working on implementing. I'm going to be there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 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 moving some things around. I'm probably going to end up being down there too. But Pearson, I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts on you know this coaching staff's emphasis on wanting the public to see and fans to see what this program is up to. You know whether it's you guys on on the the recruiting trail, you guys are on social media talking about it a lot, which is what it seems like every other coach in in America is doing. We didn't really see a lot of that though on Coach Fuente's staff. There's more of an emphasis to get people to the spring game this year than there have been in years past. So I, I'm just kind of curious as to, to the positive effects that that is, is having on why you're seeing such a better vibe around the program these days. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Coach Pry definitely has the advantage of is being having been in Blacksburg before, mm. having coached uh, at Virginia Tech before, you know, if you've been to Blacksburg and you're a Hokie, either by working there or being a student there or a player there, you understand that Hokie football is Blacksburg. Blacksburg is Hokie football. And you have a unique uh, responsibility and a unique, you know, place that we, everybody's involved. And I think that's what Coach Pry is trying to do right now. He knows that Recruiting in Blacksburg can't be done without the community, without the former players, without the fan. He understands that winning in Blacksburg involves everybody that's a part of Blacksburg, everybody that's a part of Virginia Tech. And, you know, that whole thing, did I freeze? You know, that whole, that, he understands that that whole thing goes full circle. 
You know what I mean? We, we, so that's kind of how this thing is being built. It's being built, he likes to uh, say, from the ground up, from the 100 level. The foundation is things being built where everybody's included. All 120 players on this team, a whole entire brand new coaching staff in the city and the community of Blacksburg. We want to we want to build this thing together and get this thing going. And that's why he's excited about, you know, filling Lane Stadium and getting everybody in there to showcase, you know, this uh, future look. Hey, Pearson, do the guys know, because uh, I know, you know, my son always jokes I me, mean, you got you and I both have you know, a nice size family and our kids know we were standout athletes, but you know, they look at us as old school, you know, VCR oh, yeah. tapes, you know what I'm saying? Like, man, you know, y'all had this, y'all ain't had that. And to make matters even more challenging, you and I were there building Virginia Tech. You know, we got sponsored by Nike during our time that we were hype. You and I were there when the Merriman Center was being built, and that was a big deal when they cut the ribbon. You know, we were there before Into Sandman was the entrance. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We did, we just came out to... That was it. You know what I'm saying? But with that being said... Did that? Do they know that you were nice? Do they know that Greg Williams called you one of the smartest football players he ever coached in the NFL? Do they know that you had to pick against Miami on Saturday night that sealed the win when they were going mm -hmm. for two to tie the game? Do they know about? I know they know about JC because he was the interim in his highlights. But you and Gavea Winslow and do they really understand this group of kids there in Blacksburg, the DBU legacy and all this stuff? You know, because that's the biggest thing is just making sure, and I know Pride knows this because we've had a lot of former player alumni Zooms and he wants to get us back. And the previous staff, they struggle with that, but it feels like this, you know, with so many former players on staff, do they know though? Do they know about, you know, like, yo, you know, Coach Pearson was that dude. Do they know about the legacy? Well, you know, am I still here? You know me, the last thing I'm going to do is talk about my stuff. You've known me for a long time and everybody yes. knows me. I'm not going to sit there. So. What I try to do, man, is without telling those guys, you know, that I was a, a player that accomplished a lot at Virginia Tech, I just try to instill it through my life lessons in the way that I coach them. I try to, you know, I, I don't want to throw on a, a YouTube highlight film for those guys, but hopefully they understand that when I'm telling them something, it's because I lived it. When I'm, when I'm enforcing something, it's because I've done it. And when I'm showing them something, it's because, you know, I, I've, I've done it the same way that they've done it. And it's, you know, I, hopefully they understand, you know, and, and there's, there's a couple of things around the building, like plaques and stuff that, you know, with my name on it. But, uh, you know, very rarely would I, do I talk about my career. It's been so long ago, Dwight. It's been 25 or years ago. It's been, <laughs> so, but, you know, and, and these guys, you know, if they can't pull it up on a YouTube, they don't know anything about it. We actually have some old film like on, on the Exos that I could probably pull up, but it's so grainy, like the clips they gave in 98 is so grainy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, nah, you know, I try to, you know what I try to do? I try to instill confidence in those guys in themselves and, and, mm -hmm. and, and a lot less about, you know, the accomplishment that I did, but I also try to use the life lessons that I learned at Virginia Tech to help instill that confidence. No doubt, no doubt. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's awesome, Pearson, that I the, this coaching staff has also clearly made an effort, I think, to connect with former players. And, and it's not that I, I think that Justin Fuente didn't. I just think that they probably did that a little bit too late in his tenure that where they started to kind of involve the alumni a little bit more. It, it wasn't really until there there was a lot of backlash there. So uh, it, it makes sense that that you know, do I would be curious if, if they're the current roster is aware of, of kind of how this program was built. That's kind of how I used to introduce you when we used to do the tailgate show. I was like, this was the guy, this is why they call it the lunch pail defense. It was Pearson. It was guys like Cornell Brown and, and, you know, all the great players that they've had JC price in the past. So, but there's been a lot of transition over the last couple of years you know obviously a brand new staff's coming in but you know coach foster you guys are still kind of trying to i imagine bring some of that mentality into the new system that you guys are running what do you think about that uh you know um coach prize a, a, a phenomenal defensive coordinator uh Co coach coach marv is a great defensive coordinator he's built a staff of guys that he's had relationships in within the past at various location you know none of coach prize the head coach marv is the defensive coordinator coach Quinn, coach price uh 
uh, Derek Jones. These guys all have a wealth of knowledge. And uh, these guys have all been a part of uh, all the people that Coach Price hired. It's been a part of Coach Price's legacy in different occasions. He was combined a staff with a lot of different strengths that is going that he's going to be able to instill all the wealth of knowledge that he gained through coaching, starting uh, with Coach Foster and all the various places he's been. And we're going to put that mentality that he his vision on the field. Now there are going to be a lot of similarities to blue collar football because that's the mentality that he was raised on. Good. You know what I mean, it's going to be a lot of similarities to what Coach Foster's done because that's the mentality that he's been a part of and, and some of the things that he's cut his bread. But he's, he's done a great job in his career and he's created his own blueprint that he's going to make this defense shine with what he's created. Now it's going to look a lot like old blue collar football. So a lot of people are going to say, oh, that's old Bud Foster's type of football. But that's actually Coach Pry and Coach Mars football that is just running parallel with the Hokey uh, mantra. And, and that's going to be good for us. Absolutely. Let, uh, uh, I, you get me. I'm getting excited because that's <laughs> – I, I remember – you guys understand, I went against Pearson, J.C., Hank Coleman, all those guys for years. Corey Moore, Carl Bradley, Chad Beasley. You understand, the game was easy, bro. The game was yeah. and I went I went against some dogs. I went against Chris Holvan, Vonnie Holiday, Ebenezer Ekubon, uh, my guys up in Syracuse, Miami, uh, Damian Lewis, who played in the league for years, Dan Morgan. But when you go against those guys, man, you know, it's great, man. I just, I just, I'm just excited because it sounds he can't, Pearson can't say this, but I can. We're gonna get some more goons. We're gonna get some more dogs <laughs> out there. You know what I'm saying? I'm not talking about personal fouls and mm -hmm. and and targeting calls. I'm talking about a intelligent recklessness. My favorite Amazing. saying by Coach Frank Beamer. But, um, you know, in all seriousness, man, uh, Pearson, you know, you're a safeties coach, man. And, you know, um, you're out there coaching. You're putting a lot of hours in. I know this. I have so much respect for not just for you and the staff at Tech, but college coaches all across the country, eight species used. Shout out to our guys like Jamel Smith and those guys coaching. Everybody that coaches on the college and high school level putting in work. Tell us right now, Danny and I and the people listening on SoundCloud and also the people watching on YouTube, um, some players right now, I know it's early and it's a long season ahead, but just some players right now that have that have impressed you in the spring practices, winter workouts, some guys that we should keep an eye on, at least some guys right now that, you know, you in the, in the secondary uh, or even the defense are happy about or, or, or they really, you know, showing some progress. You know, we, we have we have a lot of, of players on this football team that is has really uh, stepped up to the challenge, uh, you know, that of competing. And that's been a big uh, focal point for us is competing. And you just like you spoke on, what made us a good football team, a competitive football team, is we competed every day in practice. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing now. We're going to find out who wants to compete and who wants to win. You know, and and, and just to name some uh, a couple of names, we're very fortunate to have a guy like Jamari Connor come back yes. for another year because you know I, I'd I'd be interested to see. He's probably played him and Dax Hollyfield has probably played more. ACC reps than any other uh, defensive player in the ACC. Mm -hmm. You're talking about guys that have been playing since their true freshman year that have come back to help, to help lead this team. Those are two guys that have really shown their leadership for our defense. And, you know, and then we have a lot of younger players that, that just cut their teeth last year that are, that are beginning to do well. You know, uh, you know, young players like Dwayne Lofton, you know, a guy that was thrown in the fires, having a good time out there. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, name a whole bunch of names because yeah, I don't want to leave yeah. anyone out. Mm -hmm. But these are just guys that are, are taking advantage of opportunities that they're having, you know. And uh, like mm -hmm. I said, you know, defensively, we're very fortunate to have guys like Dax Hollyfield and, and Jamar Connor come back and lead this team with many uh, valuable reps that they've had over the four years. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And those are, those are a couple of guys too, that I imagine have a lot of pride just in Virginia tech, you know, they're, they're Hokies through and through they've, they've now been a, a part of a couple of staffs, but they still opted to come back. And I, I think there's a lot to that. They're going to be counted on for a lot though, this year. And, and obviously with the ACC coastal being the chaos that it normally is, you know, <laughs> it's going to be important to, for you guys as it, as it always is. We talk about this leading into the season with Virginia tech every single year, don't fall behind. Don't, don't get off to a slow start in the ACC. Don't put yourself in, in a hole. And, you know, I, we're probably getting a little bit of ahead of ourselves right now because we're still just talking about spring practice and the spring game. But 
it's just like Dwight said, just getting excited, you know, seeing because Coach Pry was a part of, of Virginia Tech when back when you guys played. He understands that mentality. He's bringing over that mentality from the Big Ten in Penn State where they had a ton of success. So I just know that there's a lot of people that are really excited once these guys get out there to turn them loose and, and really see what they can do. Yeah, you know, it, it, it definitely. We're excited as coaching staff. Our players are excited. The community is excited. You know, uh, uh, I think the turnout is going to be great for the spring game. Uh, you know, we have a long way to go. You know, we have a lot of you know, holes to fill, a lot of young players that are going to need to step up, a lot of older players that are going to continue to need to get better. You know, that's what any team in the spring, that's what spring football is all about. And, you know, but we're excited. I mean, I'm excited at what we're seeing. I'm excited about the progress that a lot of our players are making. We're a long way from home right now to get into where we want to be to win the Coastal, to compete for the ACC championship. We got a lot of work to do, but it's been fun. I, I will be uh, telling you a lie if I told you every single moment stepping into that building, it's been fun. The process has been fun. The guys are having fun and, and as they should, all right? Because everybody is excited about a new beginning and, and the community is and, you know, I think you'll see that in, in Lane Stadium on April 16th. You know, and I'm going to brag a little bit, Danny, on Pearson, man, because, again, when he was in playing for the Washington football team, now the Washington Commanders, I can't keep up. You know, I've been living in Northern Virginia since 2000, and my wife and I, Shanice, we go back with Pearson. He's family, him and Jamel Smith, the South Carolina boys. We had so much fun. You know, I can tell you, I'm not going to talk about it because it's the clean version, but, uh, you know, going back to the days of Miami Orange Bowl, me, him, Tony Joe, Mike Hawks, and Jamel Smith almost makes, makes curfew because we're having too much fun. But seeing, <laughs> seeing him now, you know, because Pearson is one of the best athletes ever played with and practiced against. I mean, this guy had a 44-inch vertical. And I'm 6'4", 6'5". He's not that tall. And he also was a great, great defensive mind. So Virginia Tech is blessed to have you because not only is it great to see you in this position, but it's a blessing seeing you as a father, a husband, and seeing guys like you and JC now come full circle coaching and pouring back into these young people, man. It's great that they they able to keep you. And I know it's a business and it's tough. You got to win football games. But right now here in the moment, this is great for me and Danny and for Virginia Tech fans to see. I When I announced that you're going to be on, a lot of people were excited, man. So I just want to say that. And just before we you know let you go, I want to ask you this. Um, as I talk about your life coming full circle and you being back in Blacksburg and, you know, you live in Radford and you got your, your wife and your kids. Um, when you look at Virginia Tech and how much has grown and you look at the campus and the facilities and all the stuff that's there now, being in ACC, does it, does it, do you kind of just sit back and be like, man, this is crazy. I was here <laughs> when we had like four restaurants. Like, is it, how is it, man? I know that's not a football question. It's not about cover three. I'm just talking perspective. Like, how is it, man? Just to be in this position, see yourself as a safeties coach, see you coaching just like years ago. We would, it seems like you and you guys just got on campus. And so when you look at the growth of Virginia Tech and where it is right now, what, what, what does that say to you? Well, you know, uh, just, just the other day, sitting up in the, uh, the new performance center, Former Bowman room. <laughs> the, the, the former Bowman room. You remember the Bowman? Just sitting there and, you know, we have a, a real uh, magical view of Lane Stadium across our practice field and you can look into it. And I was just telling a couple of the guys, man, I just remember when there were like a little soccer field down there and we used to run circles around that for conditioning. And you can look clear through the north end of the end zone and through the south end, through the high school beaches and see the cows grazing and things over there that is now like an intramural field. And so much has changed from when we got there. You know, we always used to, talk, you know, if you look back at it, it wasn't a real aesthetically uh, <laughs> enhancing place. It wasn't real pretty. And that's kind of what uh, we built our program and then the way we played our football, you know, and now that we've, you know, tried to play catch up a little bit so we can recruit and make the place the beautiful place that it is and we're continuing to improve, you know, you can still look in that stadium and remember the kind of football that we play. And I think that's where we're going with this program now. We want to be able to play that same football in that pretty stadium. We want yeah. to be able to look from a $20 million 
uh, performance center where our student athletes are eating now mm. and look across into that stadium on Saturdays and see blue collar football. Mm. And, I'm, and, and, it, and it fills my heart that, you know, I feel like we, me, you, uh, and all the players that played behind us and in front of us were part of building this program and where it's at now. You know, it fills my heart and I often get emotional about it. Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, when I walk through that tunnel and touch that rock, you can be playing inner same man or tech triumph. It's still blue collar Virginia Tech football. I love it. And we didn't care what was playing. We didn't care if the stadium was full. We didn't care if the stadium was empty. When we walked through that tunnel, we had the confidence that whatever opponent was on the other side of that football field was not ready to play Virginia Tech. And that's what we want to get back to. Mm, mm, mm. I love Can we it. run out of the tunnel now? Can we Yo, run out of the tunnel right? now after that? Right? Yo, he got me ready. I'm about to fall my helmet there. I got my helmet. I keep the I helmet in the past. Listen, <laughs> man, I'm telling you, I love it too, D. I love it, man, because this is what I try to tell people. Pearson, it doesn't matter if it's Cornell, it doesn't matter if it's Jim Drunkenmiller or Steve Sanders or Brandon Flowers. Everybody that went through there knows what he's talking about. They know he what he's talking about. You know, um, and I'm gonna say this about Coach Pry, because I know he's got to win football games. He's focused on this spring and then, you know, the, the, the preseason and then the fall. But I'll say this, you know he's a great coach because Pearson has always been, this is my little brother here, as far as like when he came in a few years after me. Pearson's always been laid back and chill. You know, he ain't never been about no drama. Always been a hard worker, class act. But when I seen that dude on social media, tweeting Northern Virginia, I'm in your area. I see him in Richmond, the coaching clinic with balloons. He posted up on the table, holding the <laughs> coffee. I said, Coach Fry. Got Pearson on social media. <laughs> I understand something. That ain't now me. You know what? You guys know I'm all over the place. Pearson, he be like, "Yo, I'm good back here, bro." I look on Pearson up here, popping his collar, talking trash, getting the recruits fired up. Shout out to Coach Pride, man, because he gets it. Because Pearson is active on social media. Right. Man. Let me tell you, man. That, that's tough to, for me too, because I'm telling you. And, and you gave you gave the guy credit that deserves it because, you know, about a week into the hire, man, I think we were, we were on the plane and we were getting ready to go recruiting somewhere. Coach probably wasn't on the plane. And I opened up my phone and, I, you know, all, especially uh, some of our new coaches, they're really uh, well-versed in social media. And I opened my phone up. And uh, there's a little small text there, man. And uh, Coach Price said, hey, man, we got to get you going, man, on Twitter. <laughs> we got to get you going. <laughs> because you know that it's not me. But, you know, when, when the guy gives me a job and he asks a request of me, man, you know, I, I'm going to play the role, man. I'm going to play the game. And I'm getting better. Uh, you know, I, I try to set alerts to remind myself, hey, man, you hadn't tweeted in a while. <laughs> but but you, you and I both know that that, that is, uh, you know, I, I first got my Twitter page when Coach Fuente hired me in 2019. So that was, you know, next step for me, man. But uh, it's getting better, you know. No, it is. It a little is, bit. Man. Still no, ain't got is. my Instagram going right yet. So <laughs> oh, good, man, I'll, I'll be your guy, man. And, and I'm, I'll, I'll keep it going and I'll, I'll tag you some tweets. All positive, man. Um, <laughs> You gotta be, you gotta be, you gotta be tough on Twitter because you know we got a passionate fan base. They love yes, you when do. you win, when you lose, they want to fire everybody, including me. They blame me like I called the play some nights, but um, hopefully we don't have any of those blames. Hopefully we got nothing but success, man. Pearson, it was a blessing to have you on. I know you, me, and Danny go back. You went out on the field as friends and brothers, and Danny and you had the pregame show, so. This is a mini reunion, man. We appreciate miss you, Danny. you on, man. I miss you too, man. I miss you. I miss Blacksburg. I, I'm I'm here in Richmond now, but I get to I get to do some radio in Washington, DC, talk about our commanders, talk about the Nats, talk about the Cavs and whatnot. It's amazing. It's awesome. I love it. But some of my most fond memories, not just as a professional, but as a person, are with you guys, spring game specifically chopping it up, just talking Hokies football. It's been a, it's just been a treat to, to have you guys as friends, man. The grassy, the grassy no, no. The grassy <laughs> no. Yeah. Can't wait. Yes, sir. I can't wait to see him in two weeks, man. I can't wait to be back. I am excited. Like, I'm going to get new money, bruh. I can't <laughs> wait to get there. You know what I'm saying? And my kids staying home? Bruh. It's about to be <laughs> on, man. You know what I'm saying? Yo, it's all good, though. Um, all good. But Pearson, once again, thank you for jumping on. We're going to have you on again on the um, Big 757 show, talking all things tech with me, Mike, and Danny. That's a seasonal podcast, but we'll get okay. you on there too. I know that's your busiest time, but 
we won't ask you tough questions. We just want to get you on just so you can get on and tell us how things are going and, and talk about the season and the games. And, you know, it's just going to be a lot of fun, man. We appreciate you, man. No doubt, man. I appreciate you having me on, man. And uh, we're excited about Hokie football, man. And I know I'm looking at two Hokies right now, true and true. All right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Be blessed, man. You too, man. Appreciate you, you Pearson. You too, man. Yeah. See yes, you later. Yes, yes. All right. All right, all right. That was Pearson Prelo jumping on with us, man. Safety's coach for Virginia Tech Hokies. Also a Virginia Tech great, man. He was a great defensive back. Uh, I mean, he played a rover, the whip. He could do it all. Whip. He also, like I mentioned, 44 inch vertical, played for the Washington football team. Greg Williams called him the smartest football player, or one of the smartest football players he's ever coached. That guy, and you know, for those who don't know, you know, you might remember Greg Williams with the controversy with the whole bounty gate. But if you take a step back, uh, Greg Williams was a masterful defensive mind. Some of the best teams and defenses in Washington football history, the commander's history when they were the Redskins was with Greg Williams. This is after the pretty Richie Pittavone, Greg, uh, Joe, Joe Gibbs era. This is um, when Joe Gibbs came back and, you know, Pearson is that dude, man. And he gets me excited. I know you were excited, Dan. He gets me excited because we are observers, but he's in the mix. He's in that locker room. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, you know, I, it's funny too, Dwight, because I had always wondered while, while we were doing the pregame show together, if Pearson was ever contacted about, getting back into the coaching profession at Virginia mm -hmm. Tech or, or whether it was something that he even wanted to do. So when I saw in 2019, like he said, when he got hired by Fuente and that staff, I was over the moon elated for the guy because we, you know, cause you got to play with him and I got to know him over doing our pregame shows for, for two to three years. He is a great football mind. And it's no wonder that Greg Williams has him as one of the smartest defensive players that he's ever seen. And, you know, it's funny because what I think of Greg Williams, I don't think of the bounty scandal, certainly one of the things I think of, but I think of the fact that Greg Williams coached Sean Taylor. And mm. one, one of the things that I always used to ask Pearson about was what it was like to play with Sean Taylor and being the big DC sports fan that I am, it, it, hearing him gush about that was really cool. So the fact that we get to, talk to Pearson and that we can call him a friend is is just so cool I, I he's I, I miss him so much I miss being in Blacksburg doing those shows dude the spring game where it was you me Pearson and Andre Davis the four yeah. of us on a grassy knoll dude that was that was not only was ju that just a blast and amazing and and any hokey would have been over the moon to be in that spot that I and I feel incredibly grateful for that but what an what an opportunity to sit and listen to three former tech guys that played in their in tech's heyday talk about the program and and break it down. It was just yeah. amazing, man. Yeah, I remember. That. I still have those pictures, man. And um, you know, you're right, Andre Davis, man. We'll get him on this uh, show as well. Andre Davis is a masterful speaker. This guy is just insightful, and he's a real G when it comes to just fatherhood, community service, as well as mm -hmm. he was he was special. I mean, you know, it gets we're we wrapping up the show. We got to do our legacy spotlights, but I'll just say this, man. You know, this was a great show having Hawk on and then Pearson wrapping it up because you talk to two guys that just laid on the line when they played, especially Pearson. We talk about what he means to Virginia Tech football, our alma mater, our school, university. You know, he just is just, he just gets it, man. And, you know, it's tough because I got a lot of love for Justin Hamilton. Uh, I thought he was put in a tough position, but he was a great defensive coordinator for Tech. Just getting his feet wet, I felt like he was going to really do great things. But um, it's a business. But, you know, they were able to retain Pearson as well as uh, JC and Gavea Winslow and a few other guys, man, you know. But, it, you know, what, what, when it comes down to it, I think they, they got a great coach in Pearson, man, because like Lauren Johnson, see him coach, it's not surprising me. Like Lauren Johnson – you know, Pearson Prelo, and if he was alive, Keon Carpenter, God bless his soul. There were a lot of guys I played with that just knew the game. They were athletic and talented, fast, could run, but they knew the game. And uh, Pearson was great, man. And shout out to him and Ahmad Hawkins for jumping on, giving us some some great insight on, on spring ball, man. So, Danny, this has been great. I want to wrap up with our legacy spotlights. I'll go first. You know, um, I'm going to go a little different and, and given the controversy with the Oscars and Will Smith and Chris Rock and that whole fiasco and Jada Pinkett Smith and whatever you feel about that, say that for another show. I'm going to say this. I want to shout out 
Quest Love and Samuel L. Jackson. Because and and the Williams sisters mm -hmm. and their father Richard Williams, because I felt like the selfish act of Will Smith overshadowed a special night for so many actors and actresses in Hollywood and movies and producers, screenwriters, all of that stuff. Because I've never been in that stuff, but I know just like how we glorify, we respect athletes and coaches and the time they put in, that's their craft. When it comes to actors and actresses, that's their craft. And I'm a movie guy. So uh, Quest Love seeing him on stage, I think we were still trying to get over the slap and seeing him win an Oscar. And then Samuel L. Jackson, whether you like him or not, which a lot of people know, he is entertainment personified. To see him get a Lifetime Achievement Award was really, really special. And I'm just happy that he was blessed to get his flowers, as they say, right now. Because, um, you know, whether it's the Star Wars trilogies or coming to America where he was in the McDowell's with the shot, the, the 12 gauge shotgun or, <laughs> you know, a time to kill. I mean, the movie with LL Cool J when he was, he got eaten by the shark. I mean, Samuel L. Jackson has been in so many movies, man. And I just want to give them a shout out for their legacy spotlight. I know we normally keep it, you know, we talk about so many people, but I just think we look at, especially Samuel L. Jackson, his legacy, and what he what he got. And then finally with the Williams sisters, man, you know, I saw that movie and Will Smith definitely deserved an Oscar for that. But when it comes to a father like Richard Williams, who I'm a father, and when you invest in, you have a great father too. Mm -hmm. When you are a father, sometimes it's a thankless job because the mothers do so much. The mothers carry the torch, they laundry and getting them healthy when the kids are sick, you know, Whatever. I mean, I pitch in a lot too, but there's something special about a mother fathers can't do. But there are a lot of great fathers out there, contrary to popular belief. And Richard Williams, yes, he was controversial at Wimbledon. He was outspoken about a lot of things, but to prophesize and see that Serena and Venus were going to be two of the best of all time and to give up his Saturdays, his evenings to fight for them, I thought it was great, even though he didn't win the Oscar. That was his story. Mm -hmm. And I just think that was just great. And I think he doesn't realize now, but he inspired, you know, this is Victory Life, Leave a Legacy. You know, we talk about that. Those three people I mentioned, Quest Love from the Roots, Samuel L. Jackson, and Richard Williams definitely are leaving a great legacy. And it was just cool to see them get their awards, man. And hopefully, you know, people can reflect on that once all this other nonsense clears up. Yeah, and I think that everybody's pretty sick of hearing about the Will Smith Chris Rock dust up. But my man, I don't think I could. I don't think I could possibly top that. I, very well said, and and three gentlemen that are more than deserving of of that shout out. I, I actually, I've, I have it bookmarked. I actually haven't watched Questlove's documentary about uh, the Harlem Music Festival from the '60s, but I have, I have it on my list, and it's definitely going to happen because I. I've heard that it's absolutely amazing. And I love Questlove. He's awesome. Um, he oh, cool. He's really cool. Music. Yeah, he's a oh, cool I, dude. I, I still has hair. That's crazy. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, last time I we did a Legacy Spotlight, it kind of centered around April 16th. And, and that day is is fast approaching for us. And obviously it means a lot um, to anybody in, in the Virginia Tech family, what, whether you're a student, a, a former player, both a teacher, uh, you know, they're, they're, or even just, you know, part of – the staff that cleans the, the classrooms every single day. Like everybody's a part of that. And, you know, April 16th is, is always a day of remembrance. And we're a couple of weeks out from that. It'll be the spring game this year, but I, I just, I wanted to give a shout out to, to, you know, those 32 victims, obviously, just in case we don't, we don't get the chance to, um, we don't get the chance to, to sync up and, and do another show before the spring game. So I, I want to make sure that, we never forget those 32 victims that we lost that, that day, 32 Hokies, 32 angels. Um, it's, it's tough. It's tough to think about every day. My girlfriend was there, um, mm. not quite on campus, but she was in Blacksburg that day. She was just a freshman. Um, and I, I know a lot of people that were there that day. I know someone that we lost that day. Um, so a shout out to, to our 32 victims, the first responders um, that were there to, to help and try and restore some of the, the, the peace uh, and, and 
you know, first responders everywhere. I mean, we've had tornadoes coming through Richmond for all afternoon. It sounds like they might be making their way up towards you too, buddy. So, you know, be they careful. Are, out they, there. Are, they are, they are. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but I just, I want to, you know, I want to, I want to shed some light on that. Just, you know, make sure that, that we never forget because that day's coming up and um, it's, it's hard, but at the same time, it's, it's important that we, you know, we pay our respects and, um, you know, continue to, 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 emphasize and demonstrate the Virginia Tech way. You know, Nikki Giovanni had some of the most inspiring words possible, and she's just an amazing poet. Um, but I would also say, and if you, if, you, if you need to pick me up, go check out some of what she said after, after April 16th in 2007, because she was, she was a beacon of light in, in a very dark time. No question. One of the best speeches I've ever heard in my life, man, even if you weren't a Hokie, man. So mm -hmm. I appreciate you, Danny, as always, for jumping on to meet me as my co-host. And I, uh, once again, want to thank Ahmad Hawkins and also Pearson Prelo for jumping on, sharing their insights and giving us some nuggets on spring ball with UVA and Virginia Tech. And also to everybody subscribe to Victory Life, man, the fans, the people on Twitter. If you follow us on YouTube at Victory Life, also on SoundCloud. And also make sure no matter where you go, no matter what you do, like we say every episode, Make sure you have a positive impact. You leave a great legacy, man. On behalf of Danny Noakes and myself, Dwight Vic, we appreciate y'all, man. Y'all stay up.